Hello, this is Dr. Stephen Cangiano. I am the president and co-founder of RDNT Media and Events with its online companions, relationship-development.com and humanity-upgrade.com. I am here today with Dr. Aaron Leonard. We had some technical difficulties on our first try, and that gave me extra time to prepare. And I have to tell you, I am so impressed with this woman. I'm gonna tell you why, from a personal level, she is the mother of twins. Now, I am the father of twins. These twin girls exceeded my level of competency on a daily basis. Not only that, she is a full-time psychotherapist, eight hours a day, in the trenches with people all day, and she is a prolific writer, author, lecturer. She's been on multiple news TV shows. Multiple, she's in multiple magazines. She's written a book. I want to give you how to raise a secure child, parenting with empathy. We want to get into empathy. I could go on for a half hour on her credentials and all, all the stuff she's done. But what I want to do is, is I really want to get into, first, Erin, welcome. Thank you for joining us, number one. Number two, how do you keep it all together? I think a lot of people out there would really benefit from us starting right there. I, I, actually, first, I'm sorry. Did I leave anything out on your resume or the stuff you did before we get into that first question? That was a great, great intro. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I just try and uh, put my relationships first. It's, it's as simple as that. And I'm... Um, you know, obviously a big proponent of empathy and that's how I maintain the closeness and the vitality in almost all my relationships. And so, you know, if my relationships, if my kids are feeling good and if my relationships are hearty and healthy, um, you know, the rest of my life seems to fall into place. So I try and really focus on that. And I let a lot of other, I let a lot of other things slide. If you saw my pantry, you would be disgusted. <laughs> you know, there's laundry in the laundry room all the time. But the most important thing to me is my kids and my work and having fun with my kids. And so um, I'll forego housework in a heartbeat to go out and play basketball with my son in the driveway or um, go get my nails done with my daughter. So, you know, I, my life is far from organized or perfect. But um, the most important thing to me is that my relationship with my kids is, is solid and, um, and I love my work. So that's, that's not hard to really focus on and work hard with. Well, you know, I'm going to have to disagree with you for one second because last time when we had a technical difficulty, we were trying to get a good Wi-Fi, we, you walked us all around the house. It was perfectly neat and clean. So I, I, don't, I don't know if I totally agree with that, with that. Now, you also say, and, and I, this is really intriguing to a lot of people, I'm sure, that you love your work. Tell us what your work is, and then I want to get into some, maybe some areas of tension and some interesting areas in, in what you do and the definition of what, what, what empathy is. Sure. Um, I'm a psychotherapist, so I see people all day. So I see children, adolescents, adults, couples, families. Um, and I basically do therapy from the minute I get into work until the minute I leave. And it's wonderful. And, you know, I've, I trained and, and went to, um, I mean, I've had a lot of schooling. I have a PhD. I did my research on empathy. I've um, put empathy into practice every day at work and at home. And so, and I write obviously a lot about empathy, but my work is, is very clinical. I'm a psychotherapist. Um, I was trained and psychoanalytically. And so that's sort of um, what I do on a daily basis. Gotcha. So, and, and, and how do you, so how do you, how do you keep from burning out? And I, you know, I've read, I've read a lot of your articles and I'm just curious to hear from you because I have, I have some idea from reading your material, but just tell me, how do you keep from, because you, you take on a lot every day. Sure. Um, I, for me, being empathic is, is um, one way to be very healing. And if I can heal someone um, and they walk out of my office feeling understood, 
um, feeling better about their situation themselves and feeling more resilient, I've done a good job. So when I'm able to use my empathy um, to heal, I, I really, it empowers me. It doesn't, it doesn't zap me. So a lot of, a lot of therapists, you know, and I get that question a lot. You hear, you know, for eight hours a day, people come to you with problems. Don't you get depressed? Doesn't it weigh on you? If I'm able to help and heal, um, through my interventions and my practice and my empathy, then that, that breathes new life into me. It's very invigorating and it's, it's very um, empowering for me. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, just meeting you off camera, you are invigorated. It's, it's obvious in your persona, which is really nice to see. All right. Um, I'm going to bring up, uh, maybe like, maybe create a little tension in the conversation because I know you've done this so much that I, I really, really want to understand this uh, thing. Um, there's a book called Against Empathy. Um, mm -hmm. So before we get into that, can you tell me your definition of empathy, how you use empathy in your day-to-day -day life? Sure. I mean, in your day-to-day -day life and practice. Right, absolutely. So empathy for me is, an emo is emotional attunement. So it is when you really put yourself in, your other, in the other person's shoes, but you really feel the emotion yourself. You, you sort of go there. You, you feel it with them. It's, it's emotional. You're in sync. You're on, on the same emotional plane as the other person. So you feel what they're feeling for a moment. Gotcha. And then, mm -hmm. Yeah, please, go ahead. Please finish. And that's really important because then, then you're able to convey to them, you know, while you're on the same emotional plane, while you're emotionally attuned to, to their emotions, um, you're able to convey that you understand. And, and that's really healing for them. Gotcha. And, okay, so um, is there a distinction between empathy, feeling their emotions, like emotional empathy, and... Um, and one of the people I follow is Paul Bloom. He calls it cognitive empathy, where you don't feel it, you, you rather you understand it. And that is there a do you make that distinction, or is that not something? Well, I think it can be helpful. So interpersonally, you you want to go there. You know, you want to try and really empathize and understand how the the other person is feeling. However, you know, you can't do that with everyone. There are, you know people across the world that, you know, you, you feel for, um, but having, you know, it's really hard to heal them with your empathy. And so that's when cognitive empathy sort of comes into play. And, and that's important that we feel for the plight of others. Gotcha. So if I can correct me if I'm wrong here, if we can make the distinction, cognitive empathy is understanding the emotions. To, to, to be able to understand and be able to relate to that person um, uh, well versus emotional empathy where you actually feel the emotions that people have. And I know there's something you're very familiar with, maybe you can help the listeners and the viewers, is uh, maybe talk a little bit about mirror neurons and how human beings have this natural ability to immediately sense people's emotions. Right. So this is a very important piece that I don't think Dr. Bloom covered in his book. So this was sort of left out of the research, but there's a huge body of research that talks about empathy and mirror neurons. And so basically what, what research um, tells us is that when, when infants, from the very beginning, when infants receive emotional attunement, when they receive em empathy, that's enacting the um, sort of... Um, multiplication of mirror neurons. And so that, that really helps a child's brain grow and develop. And um, eventually, hopefully, you know, that child becomes sort of emotionally regulated and emotionally intelligent. And so th they learn how to soothe um, themselves and have empathy for others. And so, you know, basically this, ha you know, this body of research is really important and it, it starts, you know, in biology. So they did studies um, on goslings and things like that, but they really moved it to human infants. And, and they realized that um, without empathy, without emotional sustenance, you know, the infant's brain doesn't, doesn't grow. So in one of the um, studies that, I mean, one of the um, 
places that we got this sort of information from was the Romanian orphanages. So these infants and toddlers were left in conditions where their biological needs were met, but they got no empathy, they got no sustenance. Um, and what happened was, you know, these, um, these kids, part, parts of their brain, they failed to grow. And so when they, when these, the conditions of these orphanages were discovered, you know, a lot of American families ad adopted these kids and these babies into their homes lovingly, which is a valiant thing to do. And, and when they, and, but these kids and um, toddlers and adolescents had a, a slew of difficulties, you know, from behavioral to emotional, to um, aggression, hostility, you know, an inability to attach, a lack of empathy. And what they did was they, they started to do brain scans on these kids and they found dark gray areas of these brain of their brains where brain life was not activated and it wasn't um, in use because because they lacked the empathy in infancy and toddlerhood and early childhood. And so part of their brain actually died, which is which is compelling. It's a compelling body of research, um, attachment, empathy, and um, sort of how it impacts the brain. Yeah, no, that's an amazing, I heard, I heard of that study. So let me just, uh, because uh, as, as physicians and doc PhDs, we tend to get into a little bit of a swamp. So if I, if I, if I have this clearly, so we have a natural uh, mirror neurons, and maybe this is probably an evolutionary psychology thing where the troop, the group, or the tribe if there was some kind of something to be afraid of, if somebody was afraid, that actually was almost, there's actually an emotional contagion. On the flip side, this Romanian, I actually thought it was Russian, but you know better than I do. So basically these children were just left in their cribs, fed, but not, not uh, really taken care of, no emotional um, attachment. There was no love, caring, caressing like normal kids do. And this created severe emotional problems, and it had a physical substrate or a physical uh, finding on functional MRIs and MRIs, et cetera, which is really an amazing, an amazing thing. So how do you, so I'm going to read a quote from Dr. Bloom who go against empathy, and, and I had actually read the book before this, and um, I mean, this guy is the editor-in-chief of behavioral sciences and brain sciences, and this is what he says. And I'd love to hear your reaction as a professional in the trenches every day. And he said, how do I raise my kid to be a good, happy, successful kid? He says, we just don't know. Sure. That, that, that what he said, despite everything, he said, he actually goes as far as to say that the physical science, physics, geometry, yeah. astrophysics, yeah. Um, is easier than psychology, that it's very, very difficult. It's a much more difficult science than we had actually ever appreciated. I'd love to hear your reaction to that, what you think about that. Sure, so um, um, I think that in terms of um, raising children, you know, empathy is the, the thing that um, really allows a child to be able to eventually self-regulate and have emotional capacities, the deeper emotional capacities like introspection, remorse, um, empathy for others, conscientiousness, um, and selflessness. And th those are extremely important um, capabilities for human beings. So, you know, basically when a children gets emotional susten sustenance, when they receive empathy, basically they, that allows them to um, sort of consolidate their sense of self. So the feelings and emotions are really the essence of who we are. They sort of differentiate us from each other and, um, and they, they make us unique. And, and our emotions, how we feel, really comprise our sense of self. And when, when emotions are validated and empathized with, the child immediately feels um, a, sort of a, a more secure sense of self. And when children have a secure sense of self, they are able to be kinder. They're able to be more thoughtful. They're able to be um, uh, more empathic. They're able to, to regulate their own emotions you know, in a really healthy way. So kids who, who don't get that sort of um, soothing and empathy don't really, they, they have a very insecure sense of self, which, which actually sort of um, evokes, the, evokes a um, need to, to create and resurrect a, a bunch of defense, uh, you know, a rigid sort of structure defensively, which 
is, you know, comprised of, you know, hostility, aggression, narcissism, um, projective identification. And, and those, those things are really, really troubling. Interesting. So, so I just want to let the people know that you are an expert in this field. You actually won the Shaw, Shaw Research Award at Children's Memorial Medical Center. And so you've been in the trenches for many, many years. What are the most common emotional issues that you see with ch children? And I know this is a broad question. How do you bring them forward on a continuum? What do you, sure. how do you help them? Right. So one, one of the um, things that I commonly talk to parents about is avoiding confusing sympathy with empathy. And Dr. Bloom, you know, in the most of his studies, he's confusing sympathy with empathy. So um, whenever someone, so unfortunately, he's misinterpreting, you know, empathy is sympathy. Sympathy is when um, you put yourself in the position of saver or rescuer. And sympathy is also, and or when someone puts you in the position of saver or rescuer. And when you're put in the position of saver or rescuer, what happens is you lose that ability to empathize because now there's a power differential in the relationship. And it's as, it's as simple as, um, if you think about the old adage, do you teach someone how to fish or do you give them a fish? Sympathy is giving someone a fish. And really that that's strips them of their self-efficacy and it sort of disempowers them. When, when empathy empowers and it creates resiliency. And, um, but when you put yourself in a position of saving and rescuing, you strip the other person of that. And it can create sort of you know, enabling behaviors and a victim mentality in the other person. So in most of the studies that he interprets, um, the person is in a, a position of saving and rescuing someone else. So for example, he um, talks about, you know, how do you bump a child up on the, on the list for organ donors? You know, how do people make those sorts of decisions in these studies? And, and, you know, those studies are all about sympathy. There's nothing about empathy in most of those studies because the position, the, the person that they're studying is um, in the position of saving and rescuing. And so what I tell parents is saving and rescuing is not the answer. Um, being in it with your child for a few moments and empathizing with their feelings, honoring their feelings, um, that will heal them. They will, in those few moments that you can do that with them, they'll feel healed. And they, when they feel healed, then they feel empowered. And they feel empowered to try again, to try harder. It creates resiliency instead of um, dependency or sort of a, a victim type of mentality. So unfortunately, Dr. Bloom um, misinterpreted empathy as sympathy in his book, which is really problematic for empathy because empathy is not understood correctly then. Yeah, no, so I'm, I'm just thinking, how I, this is how I remember things. So empathy, by your terms, EMP, empower, where sympathy is really actually enabling. Yes, and disempowering. Yes. Right, exactly, exactly. Because, uh, you know, multiple people talk about these studies where you have one girl, one little girl who falls into a well and, and the, 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 the outcry of sympathy is overwhelming. But then if her and her brother fall in the well, it actually drops off by a significant percentage. And then if there's 10 kids who fall into a well, it drops off even further while there's thousands of kids starving, you know, I mean, you can go on to, you know, all this whole moral landscape of this. So, so basically, you know, let's bring this in for a landing here. So what you're saying is empathy is getting in touch with who you're with and, and being there with them, but also at the same time, empowering them to move forward. In other words, be, be, being able to get in touch with their emotions where they're at and not enabling that emotion, but actually empowering them to move forward. Is that, is that correct? Am I missing something? Else? Absolutely. And, and sympathy, really, because you are tempted to enable, it really makes people feel good, sort of, when they can save and rescue. So parents are less, less, less tempted to be in it for a minute and feel that emotion with their child and, and honor it, because that takes... That takes emotional energy and it's a sacrifice you know you are going there you are sort of feeling your child suffering so they don't feel alone in it so they feel connected to you so they feel understood and that helps heal them sympathy really creates sort of 
um, a sense of entitlement in the child and a victim mentality and narcissism because the child then when they're treated like you know, oh, you poor thing, let me let me call your coach and straighten him out so you don't have to feel bad at hockey. You know, that that really conveys to the child that they're not able to do it themselves and that they, they're a victim and they should always be saved and rescued. And sort of that, that sense creates a massive sense of entitlement in the child. So it's a really, you know, it's a really sort of fine, it, it's not a fine line. It's very clear if you understand really what sympathy and em the difference and really what empathy is. Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm glad this book was written, although I disagree with a lot of what he says. Um, you know, I, I'm glad this book was written because it gives us an opportunity to really succinctly distinct what empathy is. Because he has a tendency to lump, you know, a lot of emotions and identify them as empathy in this book, including sympathy. And it's really not correct. For example, familiarity. You know, we have a natural ability or we are naturally sort of compelled neurologically to find the familiar more appealing initially. And, you know, we're intrigued by the different, but initially we're always sort of just, we just naturally unconsciously find the familiar more appealing. So, you know, it's, it's a trick that uh, advertisers have known for, you know, a long time. We, we get our brand in front of people's face and, and they naturally unconsciously will go to that brand in the, in the grocery store. And that's what he confused um, as, so when people are shown something and they, you know, and, and they feel that it has an element of familiarity, you know, that's what they're drawn to over and over again. It's not, it's not empathy. It's familiarity. No, no. I just, and uh, I think you're bringing a really important tension, dynamic tension. There's always a tension in human beings between consistency and variety. And that dynamic tension is really drives a lot of behavior. So, so, you know, and for those parents out there, because I remember uh, my son had a group of friends who were extremely good athletes, college level, and, you know, and he was average. And so this was always difficult for him. And I found myself trying to help, like, do things for him, which, which didn't work. How do you help parents? How do you help parents and then i want to say how do you this is really fascinating this is a great conversation how do you bring empathy into your adult relationships into your business relationships into your um counseling relationships absolutely those are great great topics um let's let's just take anger for an example so dr bloom actually says in his book um he says that anger leads us astray in the here and now and we would be better off without it well, that's, that's sort of an extreme statement. And every human emotion is sacred and every human emotion is important. And it's how we act on the emotion that can get us in trouble. And so people who aren't emotionally healthy or people who aren't, don't have a secure sense of self, self you know, often will um, act on mo emotion um, in a way that might be cruel or hostile or lacks empathy. And so that's, that's the, the key is emotions are important. And so starting with that fundamentally is important. So let's say, let, I'll use this example a lot. Let's say my son comes home from school and he's super angry and he throws his backpack and he yells something and he's not nice to his sister. You know, I, I, I avoid, um, saying to him, uh, you know, my first intervention is not go to your room until you calm down, right? My first intervention is to say to him, you're mad. You're mad and I don't know why you are, honey, but I want to know why. You probably have a good reason. Hmm. And as soon as, you, uh, as soon as you do that, that's a very small empathic statement. They, you know, you can see it in your children, your patients. They go, and then they're, they're healed in the moment, they're calmed down, and then they can come and say to you, this is what happened on the bus. This is why I'm mad. And you help them with that then, and you logically help them problem solve that through that. So, you know, um, eradicating anger, um, making people ashamed of anger, that will make their um, cruelty and violence and callousness worse in the world, not better. So, you know, I think the fundamental premise of, Emotions aren't bad. Emotions aren't wrong. How we feel is important. They inform us about everything. You know, how people act on them. Now that's the problem. And, you know, people with personality disorders, um, 
you know, narcissists and psych, you know, sociopaths, they, they don't have a great understanding of how they feel. They sort of act defensively at all times. And so, you know, they're acting outragefully and cruelly and unempathically, but that's not because they have empathy. That's because they lack empathy. And that's a really important distinction. Yeah, the, the, beautiful. Okay, great. So son comes home angry. What you don't do is you, you don't disavow. You don't uh, berate the anger. What you say, you, you say, I see you're angry. I really want to understand why. Yes. That's, yeah, that, I, I think that's, when, when you say it here, it makes total sense. But I think that's counterintuitive to what most, most people do. Right. So, and that, and, and I think, and I'm really picky about how people do empathy. So even just saying to your, you, the less hallmarky you sound, the better. So, you know, if you can just say, you're mad, and, you know, and I don't know why, but I want to, you know, instead of you feel angry or you feel sad, you know, some of that stuff sounds a little hokey. So I just go, I just go right in with, you're so disappointed. And, you know, I would be too, if I were you, hon. And, you know, when you do that, that makes a huge difference. So doing empathy right is really critical to getting the result that you want. Gotcha. Yeah, no, no. And that, that makes a lot. And, and it really is counterintuitive to what most people do. And I assume it be, it's because most people didn't get that when they were young and they, they just actually really, really do carry it forward. How does this, how does your, and I'm going to say, super high level insight into empathy and you've helped me with some of the confusion I had. How do you, how does this inform your, uh, relation, your personal relationships? If you don't, uh, your, 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 uh, your clients and maybe even your business. I know it's a big question. But sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, if I had sympathy for my clients, if I felt responsible for saving and rescuing them from their plight, I would be burned out in a week but I'm not, I've been doing this for close to 20 years. And so, and I love it. And every day it gets better. So, you know, using empathy, what you're doing is you're, you're really helping, you're helping heal someone in the moment and you're empowering them. And then because they're empowered, they're more able to go out and solve their problems. And so that's the beauty of it. And that makes them feel great. Um, and so, it's really important. However, you know, I not I don't only use empathy as an intervention. I use I, you know I I use a ton of theory, a ton of knowledge that I've accrued through my education and through my professional experiences, case consultations, case practicums, supervisions. You know, hours and hours of that that um, training to accrue a, a very knowledgeable body about trauma, about. Um, child development, about attachment, about um, pathology. And so, you know, when I go in with the empathy, that, that's healing for the client. But also, I, I step back for a minute or take a couple steps or detach for a minute to think very logically and intellectually about my client's plight. And then when I combine the two, when I dance between the two, deep, deep empathy and super educated logic – I can find a way to empathically interpret things that they weren't consciously aware of. And that moves them so far down the, the line from anxiety and depression to feeling peace and happiness. And that's really important that it's not just empathy, you know, it's, it's logic and intelligence and, and um, conveying that in an empathic way. So Dr. Bloom claims that we can't, we can't do both. I think there's a quote. He said, you can't be both empathic and, and logical. And that is one of the most false statements I've heard. I do it every day. And most of the brilliant people I know in this world do that. They dance between a deep state of empathy and logic and intelligence. And when you can do that, when you can, there's interplay between your em empathy and your brain, you are, you excel and you, you really are a brilliant human being in many ways. And so what he said is not true in, in his book. And to want to eradicate emotion or claim that emotion is bad or shameful in some way is a huge problem because it's very dehumanizing, which is interesting because, you know, he sort of calls for a rational argument, but yet his argument is not rational in any way. It's very distorted. Beautiful, and I, and I'm gonna make sure he watches this 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 uh, this uh, thing, and maybe we can get you both on one of these days because sure. your points 
your points are really make a lot of sense. So, so here, here, I think what you're saying, which is really the human condition, um, that basically there's a dynamic tension between the emotional. Now, emotions, some people refer to them as survival algorithms that have gotten us to this point, the, 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 you know, basically the dominant species of the planet, and you can't eliminate emotions by any stretch, but also we have this cognitive advanced uh, prefrontal cortex that can inform these emotions and really direct people forward, which it sounds like, to me, like you really have the perfect balance of both. Right. I think it's important for human beings to do that, to balance their deep, deep feelings of empathy and their, log and their ability to be logical and intelligent about it. And really, um, that, that's very important. And, and so, in all, yes. Gotcha. Good, good, good. Something, but I don't know if I should. <laughs> no, no, please, please go ahead. No, don't, don't, don't. And, okay. and we can edit stuff if you don't want. This is not a, you're not trapped here. So if there's right. anything, yeah. So emotions can give us access intellectually to what we don't, we can't access cognitively. So if you think about empathy. Let me, let me, let me understand that. So, so most people believe it's a, you know, the layered approach, the modular aspect of the brain, reptile, mammal, you know, higher human cognitive. You just said that emotions give you access to your higher cognitive uh, abilities. Yes. Maybe just drill down on that because that's interesting. Sure, sure. So if you think about empathy, you know, you, um, a, lot of, a lot of times empathy comes reflexively to people. So an, a deeply empathic person doesn't have to think about how someone else feels. When they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they walk with an open heart and they're empathic, it sort of hits them. You know, it's sort of an automatic feeling. This is, you know, when you're with someone. And so in, in, in some ways, I sort of equate it to a sixth sense because you're feeling it sort of automatically. Um, now, that's not to say that empathy isn't shut down with a narcissist or empathy isn't shut down with someone who's maybe playing the victim and trying to manipulate. You know, my empathy sort of gets turned off when I encounter someone like that. But, you know, it is sort of a, it's almost automatic like a sixth sense. And so, it gives you a body, it gives you access to information that maybe your other senses don't. And when you have access to, in, to information um, about your environment and about your world, that's important. So it, um, it's almost like, you know, people talk about telepathy, you know, as a superpower. You know, if I could read someone's thoughts, you know, I would, I would understand. Well, actually, it's more powerful to read their emotions because you know how they feel and people, you know, operate on their emotions a lot. And so I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's the one part of our um, humanness that does miraculous things. It's, it's really one of the only things that heals immediately. Um, and it should be utilized more. It, it brings love and closeness to our relationships without deep emotion, without empathy. Um, you know, there would be no close relationships. There would be no love. And who wants a life without love or closeness? Beautiful. And, and yeah, so, so what, what you're saying, when you say telepathy, people go, well, that, you're not saying telepathy. You're saying that we should be able to really open and be able to be cognizant of and read people's emotions, which is a natural human evolutionary psychology thing that everybody has the ability to do. And maybe in our modern society, correct me if I'm wrong, we lose, tend to lose that ability. We, right. we tend to, we're actually more and more disconnected. Right. All right. We could go on for, I know you have to, I know you have a hard stop here. A couple of more questions if I could. Uh -huh. uh, you talked about loving yourself and I, I, you know, this is a common question that comes up in a lot of, when you have somebody that comes in and oh, I just can't, I, there's sometimes when I hate myself, I don't want, they have this self-loathing. I, I would love to hear how you approach that particular problem. It's probably fairly common. Yeah, a lot of people who come to therapy are very accountable and they want to get better. They want to feel better. And so they're, they're sort of this insightful sort of group of people. They often are introspection, introspective. They're often insightful. And often they feel shame and remorse deeply. And so when you feel remorse deeply, you, um, you 
are really pretty introspective and insightful because there's something that you don't like about yourself or what you're doing. And when you take responsibility for it by owning it and talking about it with a therapist, with your wife, with, you know, with, you know, with anyone, you know, that's really, that's a really valiant characteristic. And to me that, that speaks to um, a lot of character. So someone who comes into my office and feels deeply ashamed about something or has deep remorse about something for me is automatically sort of all right. <laughs> you know, because feeling remorse about something means you're constantly looking at yourself. You're constantly sort of evaluating who you are and then you're striving to do it better and to get better. So I think that's a really positive attribute. Um, and I think sometimes people misconstrue that. So our culture likes to say, oh, well, you're insecure, you know, if you feel bad about yourself. No, you're a good person <laughs> if you feel bad about yourself because you're owning something you're doing that you don't like or you feel like is hurting someone else and you're wanting to change that. So um, when someone comes into my office and says things like that, I say things like, I get it. You know, you feel bad about this. You know, you feel like this makes you a bad person. You know, and, and I get that and I understand that. And I felt that many times in my life too. And once you say that to them, they go, oh, and then they start talking about it. And once you get more data and more information about it, a lot of times people get stuck in a behavior that reinforced an old childhood wound, but they don't remember the old childhood wound because it's not immediately in their conscious awareness. So a lot of people who get stuck in their adult life and who are too anxious and too depressed to get out of it or to move from it or to do something different with it. A lot of it is because, you know, it's somehow in a way reinforcing in your worst childhood injuries. And so once you have empathy for those feelings and you can put your mind to the client's history and what they've gone through and their traumas and their attachment relationships, synthesize all that data, put it together for them. They go, Oh my God, you totally get it. And now I understand myself. Now I understand why I'm doing this. You know, this is something that I, you know, that was really hurt from and never got really addressed and then they recover from that and and they and you and they walk with a new sense of self and um, a more consolidated self and more empathy for themselves which allows them to have empathy for others yeah so i was going to say so you're really helping and then you said it at the end anyway you're really helping people develop empathy for themselves and what you just said is really phenomenal because I think the reaction to most people when they say, I don't love myself, you know, people say, oh, you're a great person, you know, and, and you, there's no understanding. And actually to reframe when somebody says, I don't love myself, they have remorse, they're, they've done things or are doing things on a consistent basis that they feel like they don't have control over, uh, reframing it as, hey, that's because you're a deep feeling good person who really wants to change now let me let me help you let me uh, empower you through empathy to do that is that a is that a good character is that an accurate characterization of what you said yes absolutely and one example for parents out there one example is you know so this is a good example because i feel like every parent might go through this well something similar with their child so mary my daughter was i found her in her bathroom um, sobbing on the floor and um, I went in you know and I said what's the matter she was supposed to be getting ready for a pool party and um, and she said you know I don't I don't like the way I look in this bathing suit mom and she was so upset and I I did not say to her oh you look fine get over it you're fine you look perfect you look great I didn't do that I went with what she was feeling and I said to her it you know it hurts it hurts to not like the way you look and I get that, you know, and honey, when I was your age, Nana accidentally got my hair cut too short. Everyone thought I was a boy and I spent two hours on my bathroom floor crying, you know, and when she heard that I understood that it hurts not to wait, like to wait, it hurts not to like the way you look and that her mom felt that too. That made her feel less alone. It made her feel understood. It made her feel connected to me and she got up and, and then I, you know, then I went to logical after the, the empathy, I went to logical problem solving, which is water shirt, cover up, cousin's bathing suit. Where, where do we go? How do I help you? You know, and she said to me, no, I'll wear this one, mom. It'll be okay. And she went off to the, and she went off to the pool party and had a good time. And so, you know, that speaks to the power, the healing power of empathy. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, we, we have to bring this in 
Well, is there, is there a chance we could talk about one more issue? Please. I have Oh, good. Okay, good, good, good. We're in a different time zone. <laughs> okay, yeah. We, I'm in New Jersey here. It's a beautiful day, and I know you have to get to work. Um, please, there, I'd, lo I'd love to hear what you want to talk about. Please. Okay, so he talks about sociopaths and how sociopaths have empathy, and that's how they understand and manipulate others. And that's really a, a very distorted version of sociopaths, and it's a bit incorrect. So anytime someone has empathy, they don't inflict cruelty or violence on someone else because it would be like they would be doing it to themselves, right? So, so you know, I'm not going to inflict terror on someone else because I know how that feels and I don't want anyone to feel that, that way, you know, because I have empathy. However, um, and the one exception I would say is self-defense. Obviously, people need to defend themselves. And if it comes down to it, they, you know, if they have to defend themselves violently or physically, you know, they have to do that. But outside of self-defense, if someone inflicts terror or humiliation or degradation or violence or cruelty on someone else, you know, they really do lack empathy because if they had empathy, they, they wouldn't want people to feel like that. So sociopaths lack empathy. And that's, obviously been established, you know, in the field yeah. of psychology. And, um, and he, he argues something different, that they have empathy so they can figure out how someone feels to manipulate them. And, and that's a bit of a um, misinterpretation of the dynamic. So what sociopaths do is they sort of find an empath, an empathic person, because naturally they know that those people are easy to manipulate. And empathic people aren't hard to, to figure out. You know, they're usually kind. You know, they're usually, um, I mean, everyone loses their temper. Everyone has a bad day. Everyone gets crabby. Everyone makes mistakes. But so sociopaths sort of it, it uses their intellect to sort of, you know, find an empathic person. And then what they do is they sort of storytell and, um, and, um, I guess storytell is a good way to say it. Storytell in order to elicit the other person's, their victim's empathy. And once they elicit their victim's empathy and they get the, their victim to trust them, then they go in with the abuse. So what? it's not that a sociopath is empathic. That's impossible. They're not. What it is is they're very good at abusing and taking advantage of someone else's empathy. And eliciting empathy from someone is not difficult. So yeah. they do that through storytelling and, you know, um, yeah. creating a different, different per image of, of who they are rather than realistically. So what he said about socio sociopaths being empathic is incorrect. Gotcha. Good. No, good, good. That's a great distinction because sociopaths tend to be intelligent and not understand emotions and then be able to manipulate people's emotions through and I totally agree. Stories are the best way. You know, I read your story about your daughter and the thing, you know, and, and it, you know, it's a very touching story and you do feel for young kids and especially in today's society, how it goes. Um, and the, the, go ahead. Yeah. So, so you, you did. I, and again, um, anything else you want to say on that topic? Because yeah. this is fascinating, please. Yeah. Absolutely. So another thing that he says in his book is that um, if people have empathy, they um, are automatically opposing or, or turning callous to someone who is different from the person they're empathizing with. And that's very false. So, you know, you know, Lawrence Kohlberg, he's the king of morality, right? And, you know, everyone knows Lawrence Kohlberg. He, the peak of his morality py pyramid, the most evolved sort of moral people, are able, in his words, to you know perceive competing perspectives, to contemplate and have empathy for this perspective, and contemplate and have empathy for this perspective, and then and then they make a decision. So um, emotionally healthy people are able to empathize with um, uh, one person who has a competing perspective than another person, and so and that's what I do in couples counseling every day. Just because I empathize with you know, one partner doesn't mean I don't empathize with the other. It means that I can empathize with both. And so what he's saying that they're mutually exclusive is that's not correct. Um, and the other thing is he talks a lot about if you have empathy for someone, you are going to act violently or cruelly to um, the person that 
you know, harmed them or you feel like is a threat to them. Also not true. You know, when people seek retribution, when people seek revenge, when people seek uh, vindication in a violent, cruel way, you know, their personality disordered. You know, emotionally healthy people do not actively seek revenge or to seek to sabotage people. And I can give you an example. So I have a little three-legged dog that I rescued, the kids and I rescued a number of years ago, and he's adorable. And the people who we, the agency that we rescued him from, they, you know, they kept his history um, confidential. And it's because he had been abused. He had lost his leg because of abuse. And they kept his history confidential. Now, I love this dog with all my heart. I would probably do something irrational, like jump in front of a train for this guy. You know, and I love him every single day. But not for a second. Not for a second. Well, maybe I did for a second. But, you know, I I haven't contemplated finding out the people who took his leg and, and egging their house or, you know, damaging their car or, you know, abusing them verbally, you know, that's not even remotely in my repertoire because I'm a health, emotionally healthy person. (laughs) So, you know, that dog gets every ounce of love every day. That's my way of correcting the wrong is love and empathy and peace, not, not seeking more violence. And I, he talks about an eye for an eye in here as the, the natural human tendency. That's not correct. Emotionally healthy people don't seek revenge violently. That's a personality disordered person who lacks empathy. So that he distorted that a little bit too in his book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and yeah, I love, I love that because m- m- you and my wife would probably be at the house burning it down, but for a second, and then you know, <laughs> yeah, just for a second, and then th- that it would come, it would come, you would come to your senses. Right. But it's absolutely, you know, an in- uh, an emotionally intelligent, evolved human being would almost you have to be a tortured soul to abuse a helpless yeah. loving beautiful animal and you know, obviously in our society we can't stand for things like that we can't allow things like that but at the same time we also and this gets into a long discussion on free will etc the um you you really you really can't hate or want revenge on that person because that person is the one who's got problems. You know, right. That's right. the person to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I totally, totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Good. Right. Because the proper authorities are going to address that. And, right. and that, that's the intervention. My intervention is to heal the, heal the animal that suffered. And if right. I went after them, I'd get put in jail and I wouldn't be here. You know, I wouldn't be here to help yeah. them. So, yeah. Right. And also I think he also makes the argument and I, I'll use my dog again in this example that if you empathize with one person, you're being callous and cold to another. Well, you know, I went to this, um, into this dog rescue tent and I saw him and he's a black lab, which I grew up with black labs. I've always had a black lab. So that's familiar familiarity at play there, you know? So unconsciously I'm drawn to him because he's familiar to me. That's not empathy. That's familiarity, which needs to be distinguished in Dr. Bloom's book as well. And so I'm drawn to him. And then my empathy kicks in when I see him sort of with three legs, you know, and so I want to know, is this dog going to be adopted or is this dog going, you know, what's going to happen? And, you know, they said, well, most people want dogs that are healthy because of vet bills, which I get. Most people want dogs that are, um, you know, easier to maintain because of, you know, lives and schedules. And I, I understand that I empathize with that completely. Um, but my empathy sort of kicked in and I felt like I could help this particular dog. And so, you know, we, we took, we adopted him and took him home, but that doesn't mean that I'm callous and cold towards the other dogs in the rescue tent. You know, if I, if I could take all those dogs home with me, if I had the money and the resources to do that, I would have, but all I could do is, you know, take one home and hopefully through people seeing how wonderful this dog is that inspires them to rescue a dog in need. And then, you know, the whole community is rescuing dogs. And, and so modeling empathy and, um, and that's, that's important. And empathy is contagious. Empathy will spread in a positive, good way. And that, that's, I think an important point. It doesn't cause callousness. That's a personality issue in the person. It, it actually, you know, to pay it forward. But, and, and to hit it, to not, not to come to his defense, because I, I totally agree with what you're saying. He would say that we can't focus on the one at the expense of the 10 or the 20 or the 100. 
which, and we tend to, because there's this compelling story about the one, and we don't want, we want, we just want to make sure that cognitive empathy uh, and focusing on the one doesn't distort our focus on the many that may even have a greater need that aren't in our field of re or frame of reference. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so this is wonderful. There's a million other questions I wanna to talk to you about. I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna put you on the spot and I'm gonna say, will you come back? Absolutely, I would love to. Oh, this is phenomenal. This is really, really, uh, and we're gonna promote this and we're gonna actually try and get this to Dr. Bloom and see what his thoughts okay. are. Yeah. Anyway, so, all right, any closing comments, anything else? Again, phenomenal. I mean, this, this is, I, I am so privileged to be able to, talk to people as an intelligent and as um, who've had so much experience in life and are such great experts in their fields. I learned so much. I learned a lot today. Any closing comments, anything you want to say? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Dr. Bloom advocates for using our heads and not our hearts. And I think that that's a very dangerous statement because our emotions and our feelings are what make us human. And so if we use our heads and not our hearts, we're no different than a machine, a computer, a robot. And, you know, if we use our hearts correctly, and if there's balance between our heads and our hearts, then we're brilliant humanitarians and we're brilliant human beings and we have healthy, vital, close relationships. You know, if, if, if we just use our heads, you know, we're, we're no different. We might as well have an on and off switch. Yeah. And I think that you've really illustrated this balance between how do I take these emotions that we've, that have gotten humanity, this survival algorithms that have gotten us to this point and temper it with that higher cognitive scientific intelligence um, and have really have the best of both worlds. And I have to say, you have articulated that better than anything I've heard or read in the last two years of doing research. So I really, Really hats off to you. And, and I say that with, you know, having my wife, I drive my wife crazy with all the things I listen to reading. Why are you reading? Why don't you pay attention to me? And it's, uh, you really have articulated it perfectly. Oh, so with nice. that, Dr. Le Dr. Aaron Leonard, thanks so much. Uh, a lot more to talk about. Uh, this is Dr. Stephen Cangiano. I am the president and co-founder of RDNT Media and Events, signing off inviting Dr. Leonard to come back. Thank you so much. Thank you.